grass fires. As a wildland firefighter, should you think that these fires aren't as risk-prone as wildfires that burn in denser and more complex fuel types? Should you let yourself become more complacent on what you might perceive to be just another routine grass fire? As you are about to see, such a mindset is a mistake. That's why the following observation has been identified as one of the key common denominators of fire behavior on tragedy fires. Flare-ups generally occur in deceptively light fuels, such as grass and light brush. After reviewing the tactics that resulted in several serious firefighter burn injuries that happened on grass fires during a recent wildfire season, the Texas Forest Service developed the Attack from the Black training program. A lot of people do underestimate fire activity, fire behavior in, in grass fuels. Um, short grass fuels, not so much, but a lot of our grasses in Texas, the Johnson grasses, uh, some of the bunch grasses are very tall and can generate um, flame lengths up to six to eight feet. Um, that can reach out and touch you, and it has touched a lot of folks. Got too close, um, the intensities off those fires can cause serious burn to firefighters. So grass fires are never to be taken lightly. Um, the other thing about grass fires is how quickly they can move, up to eight miles per hour. Um, a lot of folks can't run eight miles per hour. Uh, driving eight miles per hour can be difficult if your uh, egress is blocked, you know. Um, we've seen, you think about it, you've, we've seen wildlife that has been caught by grass fires and killed. Um, and a lot of that, those wild, a lot of deer, uh, a lot of animals are a lot faster than we are. So grass fires, it, it's, it's a very serious danger to firefighters, especially when, when cured season, uh, those winter months, and when you put wind behind it. It's, it's nothing to be taken lightly. You know. Grass is a common denominator in, in injuries. And I, and I think the reason is, is because the fire environment can change so quickly in grass fuels. Uh, one minute you'll be looking at a flank fire, the next minute you're looking at a head fire. Um, grass fires produce a lot of smoke. Visibility and keeping an eye on where the head, where the fire is going, a lot of times is very difficult to do with grass fires. Um, grass fires move so quickly, there's always this sense of chaos confusion that surrounds fast-moving grass fires. There's people moving everywhere. Uh, you throw an interface into that, you throw highways and traffic into that. It's uh, a very confusing situation, very hard to sort out. So distractions abound and firefighters may lose track of where that fire is, where they are in relation to the fire, and become entrapped before they know it. Uh, grass fires are very serious and very dangerous. We saw grass fires run through communities this year with that 30 and 40 mile an hour wind. That's not just a grass fire. Grass fires, I remember having this discussion with the Weather Service several years ago. They wouldn't put out red flag warnings because they didn't think we had damaging fires during winter months. We only had damaging fires during the summer. Well, that's wrong. And we've seen the results of that this year. Grass fires can be very damaging. They're shorter term, they don't last, you know, two, three, four days, but during that nine hour, 10 hour period, they can be very destructive. The Attack from the Black program aims to counter the mindset of those firefighters who might feel that grass fires are not that critical. Because these fires often burn in short, light fuels, some firefighters may tend to encounter them with their guard down without taking adequate safety precautions. If you know if you're standing in in fuel, then you are part of the fuel. That's that's what you know. I always tell our guys. Anytime we can fight a fire from inside the black, when we're doing a direct attack, then you know our trucks stay inside the black. Our firemen, 
drag the black with them. You'll hear, you'll hear them say a lot, drag the black, which I guess is kind of old school, but 10 years ago when we started wildland training, uh, we're hearing some attack from the black now instead of drag the black. Uh, but that's, that's pretty common, uh, you know, other than when we're doing an extended direct attack. What do you mean when you say drag the black with you? Keep one foot, one tire, one part of your body in the black. Um, you know, that's the biggest safety zone there. If, you, if you're standing in the black, you're just a hundred times more, you know, a hundred times less likely to get into trouble than if you're standing out in fuel, whether you're on foot or whether you're in a vehicle. Uh, this year I've seen some fire apparatus uh, that thought they were in safe locations um, and found out rather rapidly that they weren't. You know, it's a, a misconceived notion that, uh, well, I'm just a little ways out here. You know, I can always turn and run right back into the black. Um, that wasn't the case this year when we had the extreme fire behavior. Uh, you know, just a matter of, of seconds or minutes was the maximum if you had a wind shift um, or, or the fire traveling the way it did. One of the most unsafe practices discovered during this review was the tactic of attacking grass fires from a position directly in front of the advancing flames, often while standing in unburned fuel. One of the, one of the real simple things that, that we train on, uh, that, that we just pound into firefighters' brains, is, is LCES. And, and I'll, they get tired of me saying it. They get tired of the other officers in the department saying it. Uh, but, but lookouts, communications, escape routes, and safety zones. Uh, every time we have a training session or every time we have a training meeting, if we have an after action review, uh, if we're doing a briefing prior to suppression tactics, uh, we always mention LCES. And, and not to uh, take away from the, the 10 standard fire orders or the 18 watch out situations, but you know, that's a lot of stuff for people to remember. There's 34 things that'll save your life on a wildland fire. Four of them encompass the other 28. The, the lookouts, communications, escape routes, safety zones, and it needs a P on the end of it for PPE. Uh, safety zones, areas where you can get into, you can put your engine into, um, and you'll be safe from the fire. The black is always your best safety zone, an area that's already been burned out. Um, a situation we ran into this year was that with a lot of our grass fires and cured grasses, um, we talked about building our safety zones. Um, maybe folks remember from the Man Gulch fire story, Wag Dodge um, put a match to the grass, burned out his own safety zone. That applies in Texas also. Uh, if you find open grass areas and for some reason find yourself in front of, the, of an advancing fire, you can burn out your safety zone in these light fuels. Uh, grass burns very rapidly, and then you can walk into the black or drive your engine into the black and be safe. But safety zones are very important, and uh, recognizing those safety zones, making sure everybody's aware of where they're at, and not only having the safety zone, but having the escape route to the safety zone. Um, and as the day progresses, as time passes, you need to reevaluate where these safety zones are. Are they close enough? Are your escape routes still valid? Uh, if they're not, change them. Find a new escape route, find, maybe find new safety zones. But as we said, the fire environment is always changing. Things change over time. Uh, locations change over time. So reevaluation, um, you know, I put a, on my watch. I have an hour beep. Every time that thing beeps, I start asking if my plan is still valid. I look at where I'm at, safety zones, escape routes, tactics, uh, weather. Is everything still in line? Everything's still working? Put that hour beep on your watch. It, it helps. Again, we go back to, if, if you think about it, all these situations that put firefighters at risk can be mitigated by one simple tactic, and that is to fight fire from the black. We realize that that's not always possible, but 99% of the time I think it is, especially with grass fires. You can get your engine into the, into the black, you can get your hand crews into the black, and fight fire from the black. On March 1st, the Empire Fire breaks out west of rural Duncan, Oklahoma. 
a red flag warning for high winds and low relative humidity has been forecasted for this extreme fire weather day. The passage of a cold front is also predicted for later this afternoon. Fire behavior predictions for fuel model one for short grass indicate a spread rate of 400 chains per hour. Destry Horton, age 32, is a seven-year veteran full-time firefighter with the Chickasha, Oklahoma Fire Department. This husband and father of two also doubles as a volunteer firefighter with the nearby rural Acme Volunteer Fire Department. Even though today is Horton's day off with the Chickasha Fire Department, he opts to help fight the many grass fires that are igniting in and around the rural Acme Fire District. Around 4 p.m., after being staged at different locations all day, Horton and fellow Acme Fire Department volunteer Larry Crabb are dispatched to the Empire Fire. Horton, driving a 1995 one-ton brush rig, equipped with a 400-gallon water tank and Class 9 pump, with Crabb as passenger assistant, calls his wife to assure her that he will be home in time for supper. Driving just outside of Duncan, the two Acme Department volunteers encounter a group of firefighters. They ask them about the location of the staging area. They are told to just find some fire and fight it. Driving south, Horton and Crabb see a suppression grass rig engaged on the flank of a moving fire to their east. They turn off the paved road to access this fire area. Pushed by the strong predicted winds, the fire is moving rapidly to the east. The two Acme firefighters conduct a direct attack on its south flank, fighting fire from the black. Crab is in the back of the vehicle operating a nozzle from its rear bed. In driving the vehicle, Horton has removed his helmet, gloves and jacket, while he is wearing his flame retardant personal protective equipment bunker pants. He is not wearing firefighter boots. He has on his nylon hiking boots and a t-shirt. Crab is wearing his full bunker firefighter gear, as well as fire boots, helmet, and Nomex hood. However, he is not wearing gloves. Neither Horton or Crab have fire shelters. Inside the increasing smoke and heat, Horton drives from the black into the unburned fuels. With shifting winds and a sudden increase in heat from these now igniting grass fuels, plus poor visibility from the thick smoke, Horton puts the truck into reverse. He leans out the window and yells to Crab. We need to get out of here! In backing up, Horton inadvertently steers into a ditch, knocking Crab off into the barbed wire fencing. With wind-whipped flames, heat, and smoke overrunning their position, the truck is stuck. With practically no visibility, Horton immediately jumps out of the truck to help Crab, now entangled in the barbed wire. In seconds, as the fire front burns into them, the flames and heat engulf Horton's face and upper torso. Crab sees Horton's t-shirt melt into the man's chest, and his boots dissolve into the firefighter's feet. After the flames pass over them, Crab frees himself from the barbed wire. With burns on his own hands, face, and lower back, he helps Horton away from the burning truck, leaves him at a large tree, and then runs for help. Firefighter Horton suffers severe burns over half his body, including his lungs. Crab receives second and third degree burns to his hands, face, and lower back. The doctors at the Oklahoma City Burn Center warn Destry Horton's wife that he probably won't survive that first night. Four days later, the doctors remove the mummy-like bandages wrapped entirely around Horton from head to toe. They plan to scrape off his dead skin and tissue. 
Unfortunately, they quickly realize that the firefighter is burned so badly, he has no skin left. On March 24th, 24 days after he is overrun by the grass fire flames on the Empire Fire, Destry Horton passes away. When the two Acme firefighters decide to help suppression efforts on the Empire Fire, they certainly do not set out to be overrun by it. So, what went so terribly wrong? To truly learn from and respect their experience, we need to try to understand why their actions, the decisions that they made or didn't make attacking this fire, made sense to them at the time. Remember, with fires popping up on multiple fronts, they had been told to go find some fire and fight it. Next, for the first time during that long standby day, they see other firefighters beside a wall of flames moving through a roadside field. This grass fire is burning toward homes. On their own, they take immediate suppression actions. If you are in a similar situation, you need to remember to take the time to size up the fire and decide on a tactical plan before engaging with the fire. Your plan should always account for LCES. If possible, you need to brief on the fire through an incident command system. You need to establish adequate and reliable radio communications. In the wildland fire environment, you must always be wearing your personal protective equipment. There's no debate. This simple decision and action can save your life. Then, you must engage your fire using safe and effective operational tactics. As you operate, you should always address the standard firefighting orders and keep alert for watch out situations. The two Emerald Fire firefighters had no anchor point. If you are in a similar situation, your tactical plan must include establishing a reliable anchor point. Having no escape routes or safety zones also contributed to this fatal entrapment. Like you had gotten off the truck and gone in across the barbed wire fence here on the right of way. Yes, sir. At that time, the fire was about uh, 20 or 30 yards out, and it it was in the vegetation, but it it wasn't going that bad. And I thought, well, I can you know get on top of it and get it there. And about the time that I got over the fence and took about 10 or 15 steps in and actually started spraying water. Uh, the wind picked up considerably. And 
boy, it brought that thing to life in a major way. And there wasn't anywhere to go. It was coming, it was coming quick. And I briefly thought about trying to go back over that fence. Uh, no, if you get hung up in there, that's where you're gonna stay. So the only other decision I could do was just wet myself down, try to get through the fire and get into the black. And that's pretty well what I did. And just waited for help to come. And thankfully Richard would turn around and come back. I feel bad because, uh, you know, this is kind of a rookie mistake. Uh, I had training, I knew better. But the old saying, complacency will get you every time. And it uh been a long time since we had a fire this size. And uh, I was one of the later arriving units. And I'm thinking, you know, this thing's running away from us. And when I went in to make my initial attack, it, it, it wasn't going that bad. It was coming to me, but it wasn't going that bad. And uh, like I say, the the tone goes off. You come up to the station, you grab your pants, your boots are already in them, you grab your coat, grab your helmet, throw it in the truck and take off. And uh, Richard told me where to go. I went there. Uh, oh, there's fire, there's fire. I gotta get to it. I got off the truck, started to pump, went over a fence, I knew better and uh, started spraying. Uh, about that time, the wind really picked up and uh, it was coming to me faster than, than what I was comfortable with. And I looked behind me and I thought, I can't get back over that fence in time. So the only thing I could do was just hose myself down and try to make it through the fire and get into the black. And uh, you know, if there's a message that I could send to anybody, guys, take the time, you know, Get your head straight, get your gear on. It might be hot, it might be a little heavy, it might be a little cumbersome, but if I'd have had my gear, I wouldn't look like I do right now. Take the time.